Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 166, Party Time! Great party games for gamers. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. We record right here live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. And it would be awesome if you could join us in the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. So tonight we're going to be reviewing a couple of party games and an expansion for one of them, all from the op. So I thought a good topic to go with this would be us highlighting our favorite party games. Now, after that discussion and the reviews, I do have my first thoughts on the Tales from the Loop board game from Free League a game that's about as far away from a party game as you can get. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. First up, a game suggestion from Bob Lai on our topic of narrative adventures games to play with younger kids. I've never played it with my group, but eaten by less than three games might fit in the category. Thanks, Bob. And I got to say, this does sound like a solid uh, suggestion. I hadn't heard about Eden, but I did a little bit of digging. And Eden is a no GM, no dice, no prep RPG about making your own Garden of Eden. No one that's completely disconnected from the biblical one. It involves playing your character as well as their favorite animal, actually creating and drawing the garden as you go and more interesting things. You can find out more at lessthan3games.com forward slash eden.html. Which is a little more involved than another game I heard about this week where there's actually no players and no GM. You put a notebook and a piece of and a pencil into a room, lock the door, and the game is over when somebody comes in because it, it's, you're representing a star system. And as soon as humanity comes in there, they ruin everything. Okay, <laughs> that, that's performance art. That's I don't know if I consider that one an RPG. Uh, next up, a couple of Doodle Dungeon-based comments. Dan Eisenhut writes, The artwork looks a little munchkinish. Added this to my list of games to look at. And Joey Martin commented on episode 161 to say, huh, I just bought a copy of Doodle Dungeon because you made it sound so fun. Well, thanks, Dan and Joey. I'm glad that our review seems to be bringing this flippin' right game to more people's attention. And Dan, the reason it reminds you of Munchkin is because it's the same artist, uh, both done by the fantastic John Kovalik. Or Kovalik. I actually don't know. It's one of the two. All right. Well, next up, some comments on our Charterstone content so far. Sharon Drummond says, I think my family may be the only people on Earth who didn't love this game. <laughs> Ryan Metzler commented to say, I really enjoyed this. Wish I could experience it again for the first time. And Jay Barron says, we really enjoyed this one. Sadly, the finished game really isn't very playable. Mm. Well, thanks for the comments, folk. Um, this is quite a range of views, actually, on Charter Stone. I think we got a, a hate, a love, and something kind of in between. Now, so far with our game, we are only still three games in, and we've been enjoying it. And I look forward to playing it more and get finishing the campaign. I think it's 12. 12 it's either 12 or 15 games. I think it's 12. I'm personally really curious about how the end game will go, uh, especially because of Jay's comment. Like, I think this might be the first time I've heard anyone actually talk about the final game after they finished. I've heard lots of people talk about how they finished it and they loved it and how they did the recharge pack and played again. But I don't think I've heard anyone talk about continuing to play the game once the campaign's done, which is supposed to be a feature of this game. Now, I know it says you can keep playing, and it's going to be really curious to see how that actually works. But I got to admit, like most of these games, I have a feeling by after game 12, we're going to want to kind of move on to something else. And that's probably what's happened to a lot of people. Or that urge to restart, to do it right. Because I got to admit, even on game three, there's stuff I would have done different in game one, knowing what I now know in game three. And well, there's still nine more games to go. So that'll probably come up again. Now, it's interesting. I've gone through the comments on this one, and I haven't talked about them much because I don't want to spoil this mm -hmm. for neither Mo or anyone else who wants to play this game. But I do admit that in the comments, there are as wide a range of opinions about this game as we just showed here. Uh, they all and they all pretty much spread about the same way. Uh, so, Sharon, you're not alone. You're not the only people who haven't liked it. 
All right. Well, the last comment I want to bring up tonight is a long one about organizing your game collection. Okay. Now, this comes from Rich, who writes, what I recommend is to keep a database with all the data that you might want to use to pick or locate a game. You can choose whatever data you like, such as number of players, time of play, how often you like to play it, primary mechanism, keywords, etc. You can even enter which of your friends enjoy which games, so you know who to contact when you're in a mood to play a particular game. I like that bit. You could also use it to track whenever you play a particular game, by date if desired, so you can see when you last mm. played something, or, for example, how many times you've played a given game in the last year. Set it up so you can filter by multiple criteria and print out reports. Whenever you get a new game, add it to the database with all the desired criteria. Then mark your storage area so each case and shelf has a designation. For example, case A, shelf 3, or whatever method you want to use. Then store your game stealth on the shelves by whatever method you deem physically best, such as weight, size, or whatever you want. When you first organize, leave some extra open space in each location section. Now in the database, enter the location as one of the criteria for each game or accessory. Then you can use the database or printed reports to locate the location of any gaming related item. If you ever change the location of given item for whatever reason, you need only change its location criterion in the database to keep track of it. Then you can reprint your physical reports when needed. You can even add additional criteria to individual play instances, such as who played, who won, etc. You don't have to hop on the computer every time you play, just create some update sheets, fill out one when you play, and toss it in a data entry bin for when you have time to enter updates into the database. For me, this works the best. Oh yeah, Rich, I'm, I'm both impressed and scared all at once here. Like, like, this sounds like a great system, but way more work than most people are going to be willing to do like i'll admit I'll, a long time ago i once tried to catalog all my white dwarf magazines so that i could look up say put in wood elves and find out all the different magazines that have wood elf rules or i could put in space hulk and find out which and i even had like the page number and everything but like i was in computer science at that time and i did it as a school project like that is a lot of work to manage your board game but it is kind of cool and personally, I don't, I, I, the paper report just kind of seems to pull me out of it. I think what you need is a tablet of some sort that's possibly mounted on the game shelves as a touchscreen or on a nearby table where you can actually just go and browse your collection, kind of like the kiosk set chapters, right? When you go to see if a book's in stock or if you can order it online. Like, I love the concept, but I, I, there's no way I would spend the time to actually do this. And I'm sure some other people are the same. So what I say to you, Rich, is what you need to do is get on marketing this as something board gamers can buy maybe an app or some kind of database for windows or whatever. Um, I don't even know if visual basic databases are still the way people go. Probably not. That, that's the last time I worked on a database. Although the one I wrote was in basic. So it's even older than that. Um, I think you could get some money for this. Like, like if you actually had something like that or talk to Aldi and um, trash Arama, if he happens to be in the chat and see if uh, you can work with board game geek. Cause some of the stuff you're, you're mentioning like plaque tracking plays and who won in that is already integrated in um, board game geek, or maybe we can convince board game geek just to add a shelf location column to their, their, their games. And then we can do it all there. Anyway, I love the concept way more work than I'm willing to go to. So what I would have to say is the app I use BG stats, which also connects with board game geek has pretty much everything already in there, except what shelf you put it on, but it's got a notes area, so you can just put that there. There you go. Can you sort it, though? Like, can you search for games based on the notes? Uh, that would, well, no. I mean, you wouldn't want to search, search by Yeah, you probably wouldn't location. want to search by location. So you could search, yeah. but, but I mean, everything else is pretty much sortable, so. My games I played with Sean. If I can search <laughs> that on there. Well, absolutely. I got Because it's yeah. all broken down by players who won, who <laughs> lost, every score. I put in scores. Alrighty, guess it's already been done. BG Stats isn't cheap. Like for an app, it's not cheap. It's not expensive. No, it's but... not expensive. I mean, there are you can upgrade. Like there, there are extra things. Like if you want to do cloud saving, it costs you more. But you're still still like starting that. at like but... seven bucks, which for many of those apps is pretty expensive. Was it that high? I don't. I, it's been a while. I uh, I didn't have enough Google credit the last time I looked, and I was over. I was around five eighty five. Okay, so it's been so a while. It's in the it's been six a while. to seven dollar range. Yeah, it's been a while, since and it might have gone up too. 
All right. I've got one more feel good comment. I wanted to bring up this week before we move on. This comes from Jason Smith who writes you, sir, Sean have an amazing voice. I'm a new content creator in the YouTube sphere and I'm encouraged by your videos. Looks like you guys have been going for a little over three and a half years. Wow. And have worked up to 1.25 K subscribers. I'm impressed. And looking through your videos, I'm also impressed by your content. It's cool to see what you've done. I appreciate the opportunity to subscribe and watch and learn from your growth. Good stuff. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Jason. It's always awesome to hear from a new fan. Yeah. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedbacks to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. One quick announcement before we get on to our main topic tonight. So we will not be recording a new podcast episode next week. Now, Deanna and I are taking a much needed uh, first vacation in two years and will be out of town for part of next week. And due to this, we won't be here on in Windsor on Wednesday night and thus won't be able to record here on Twitch or record our, our and record our next show. We tried doing Twitch from um, from the county Internet. It, it didn't go well. So we will not be here next Wednesday. We should be back the week after with a regular show, and there's a good chance we'll be able to make it for brunch on the 20th. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night question. Tonight, we're answering the question, what are some party games that hobby board gamers will enjoy? So now, longtime fans of the show are going to be aware that neither Sean, Deanna, or I are really big party game fans. Uh, most game nights were much more interested in playing about hour and a half long tactical and strategic games that cause a bit or a lot of brain burn. That said, we do occasionally enjoy a game night of lighter games, with these nights often being combined with a celebration like a birthday party or holiday like New Year's, or as part of long epic events like our Extra Life gaming marathons, where we can use a break from the brain burn and play some frivolous games. There's something to be said about a nice light party game early in an event, mm -hmm. especially if not everyone knows everyone else, to help break the ice. Then maybe again when everyone's neurons are smoking later <laughs> before heading home. Yeah, it's always nice to have that uh, aperitif before you end the night just to tie one on before you go home. Now what this means is that the list tonight, our game recommendation to list tonight, is more a list of party games we actually enjoy that may not mash up with most party game lists out there or most best party game lists or most popular or, or even party game sales. Well, I know there are a ton of people out there that enjoy games like Cards Against Humanities, its clones and games by exploding kittens and uh, munch unicorns and bears and babies and lots of other kittens in a blender, all, all these very almost mass market party games they just aren't really games we personally enjoy nothing against the people who do now this could end up being though a great list of party games for hobby board gamers which is where we took the question and the question tonight instead of coming from one specific person is actually like a combination of four different people asking us about party games and I just figured we'll kind of lump them all together as with any review show we have our opinions and that's all they are if you find you enjoy our recommendations great but if you hate the games we suggest, well, it's valuable to know what, we, what to stay away from also. So before we get to our recommendations, I just want to take a very quick moment to talk about what we mean by party game. Now, personally, I think this one's pretty clear, but just in case anyone has any questions, to me, a party game is a game that's quick, easy to learn, plays a high player count, which to me means six or more, and most importantly, is more about the experience than the points. Party games are about having fun with other people and interacting and not worrying about winning and losing. Actually, many of the games we'll mention tonight, I never bother keeping score with when we're playing them, even though the games usually do include some system for doing so. So if you're hyper competitive, you've been warned if you're playing <laughs> at our table with a party game. Now on to our recommendations. As usual for these game recommendations list, the following games are in no particular order. Yeah, tonight they seem kind of more random than usual. And I, again, it was the idea, the 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 order they came into my head and then Deanna came in the room and I'm like, hey, what party games do we enjoy? So I ended up throwing a few more in there. And then I Googled a few lists. And and like I said, the, the, we're not going to jive with the other lists out there. Um, actually, this seems to be a niche that no one else has really covered party games for gamers. So 
hopefully that'll work out well for us and we'll be the people out there putting out the information for the first time all right first game i've got is medium uh this is the psychic connection board game card game i guess i should say card game tabletop game where you are going to get a hand of cards and they're going to have a bunch of words on them and every player's got a hand and you're going to pair up with the player on your right say and you're each going to pick a card to play and you're going to say what's on that card out loud like say uh canoe and biking and then you're both going to look at each other you're going to say the words out loud as you put them down and then you're going to try and make a psychic connection you go three two one and you're going to say the medium the word that's between those two and i probably would say transport and then someone else may say something other than transport, like uh, seats, because both have seats. I don't know. And they're like, oh, if we both got it right, we get points. Lots of points. Again, I don't worry too much about the points, but we get points. If we get it wrong, we go again. But now we have to use the words we both use. So now I have to use transportation and seats. And I'm like, one, two, three, airplane. And then someone else is like, banana. And I'm like, what, banana? And then we have the whole party game thing where you go, why the heck did you say banana? And like, oh, I was thinking of a banana bike, the banana seat on a bike. And you keep going, you do this one more round if you don't have it, if you don't get it past the next player, and you just play a bunch of rounds until basically your deck runs out. There, there is a kind of timing mechanism, so you don't know where and when exactly it ends. Uh, the great thing about medium is it plays very high player counts, though I do recommend if you get like above six players, have two groups of players going at the same time. So like have one pair on one end of the table and another pair at the other end of the table going, because it can take a long time for your turn to go around especially if players aren't very good, if they're not making the psychic connection. And no, I don't actually believe in the psychic connection thing. I'm sure there are people out there that do, but it's all about reading your friends. And I got to say, this one changes up so much based on who you play with. There, there is a huge factor of playing with good friends, playing with people you've known for years and playing with strangers. And I've actually made better connections with some strangers than I have with family. So, and th th that is medium. Um, fantastic game uh, I, it is one i strongly recommend everyone have in their collection really yeah it's really interesting how the shared connections you expect sometimes mm -hmm. fail miserably whereas just people who you know grew up in the same area as, as you might have less uh preconceived notions about right. those shared experiences which allows you to actually sort of meld a little bit better and i think that's mm -hmm. what a lot of the time was happening i haven't played this with a large group i've only played it with the three of us um but what about timing i think i guess timing on the, the timing mechanism in this game can kind of make it end a little early sometimes uh do you recommend taking that out or or bumping it back for uh larger groups uh, okay so for larger groups i found it was about perfect the problem is the decks aren't made to handle like 12 player i don't know what the box says for player count you may have to add in extra decks uh, what we did find with large groups is just took a long time. And while it's engaging to watch two people do their thing, it, after a while, you've watched multiple groups of two. It's like, okay, is it going to get back to my turn? So that's why I recommend you do two rounds at once. For just three players, though, low player clown, I think you want to put in a couple extra decks because you're right. It's over too quick. Though, honestly, what you could do, too, is just start a second game. Like, like play the full round and then build a new deck with new cards. That's always possible as well. Fair enough. And that was Medium. All right, next up, I have one of my favorite party games of all time. I've got to thank my friend Jamie for introducing me to the fantastic Telestrations from the Odd. Now, we're going to be reviewing a 12-player version of Telestrations later in the show tonight. And for those of you listening to the podcast or just watching this segment, watch for that to come out on YouTube and on the blog. So Telestrations is Eat Poop You Cat or the telephone game done as a board game with drawing. So it's the whole you whisper something in someone's ear and then they whisper in someone's ear and they whisper in someone's ear. And when it gets back, you see if it matches. Well, you're doing that instead with drawings. Uh, quite simply, you're going to get a clue from a card. You're going to write down the clue. You're going to pass your book. Person's going to draw what they read. Then they can pass the book. Then you're going to look at the clue. You're going to look at what's read, written. You're going to draw it. And then draw, guess, draw, guess, draw, guess until the book gets back. Then you all laugh as you go through the book, trying to show how it went. And it doesn't usually come back around very often. And some of the transitions are utterly hilarious. I have literally laughed more playing Telestrations than any other game in my collection, any other party game. It is always uh, Rosh's fun. Absolutely. It's just a hilarious game to see, especially when you've got a good mix of drawing mm -hmm. styles because there isn't actually all that much of an advantage between a skilled artist and 
people who struggle with stick figures because yep. timing is part of it. And a lot of times, the more you draw, the more you're distracting from the core mm -hmm. of the clue you need to get across. Totally agree. And for Telestration fans, if you're not aware, there was a new 80s and 90s expansion just released uh, where you actually get 600 new words for Telestrations based on pop cultural references from the 80s and 90s. And again, we'll be talking about that later in the show, too. And that was Telestrations, including the 80s and 90s expansion. All right, next up, I got another game we're going to review tonight, and that is Hughes and Cues, also from the op. This is a game about guessing colors. You put out a big board with a big grid of colors on it, pretty much every color under the rainbow. Always makes me think I'm in Photoshop or paint whenever I see it. You got a score track at the top. Someone's going to give a cue. They grab a card. It's got four different colors on it. They pick one of the colors and then give a one word clue like pomegranate. And then people go to guess and you got people thinking, well, does he mean the bright seeds or does he mean the kind of more purpley outer shell? So they place the guess and then it goes around. Everyone puts a guess on a color. And interestingly, only one clue on each color. Uh, only one player can play on each color. And then it comes back to the clue giver and they're like, oh, okay, that wasn't close. I need more vibrant. So a uh, cherry, oh, I can't say red. I can't say cherry red. So uh, how about we'll just stick with pomegranate. We'll, we'll pomegranate juice. And they're like, oh, okay. So they're looking for a lighter color. And everyone puts a second guess. And then you get points based on how close you were. You get this little frame to put it out and get the points, but the whole thing is trying to guess a color based on a one-word clue, then a two-word clue. Getting points for how close you are with the clue giver, getting points for how many people were as close as possible. Yeah, and this is fantastic, but you also have to be careful because, again, much like we've been talking about with Medium, shared experiences can be a big deal. Mm -hmm. It are the fire trucks in your city the same color as the fire yeah. trucks from someone else's city that you're playing with, for instance? Even in our own city, they were yellow for a while. They were vermilion for a while and then switched back to red. So I don't even know why, why but it was only a, a short period of time. So And in some cities, they're yellow, like yeah. bright yellow. So or chartreuse. Yeah, yeah, I guess it's, it's chartreuse. There's all sorts of uh, strangeness. See, I would have said fire truck vermilion and then that might have been someone got it totally wrong i mean barbie uh, i know is pantone c219 uh yeah, <laughs> is, see, is barbie that, pink but you know who else knows that <laughs> yeah I, I wouldn't get it if you said barbie i'd probably go with blonde that's, that's i'd probably go in the yellows aiming for blonde all right well that was hughes and cues Next up, I've got code names, and I'm going to lump them both together. Code names, code names, duet, code names, Marvel, code names, Disney, code names, pitcher. They're all very similar. Uh, this is a word guessing, word association game where you're going to put up a grid of words and you are trying to get people to guess which cards you're referencing by giving a one word clue and a number. So you may say uh, Aunt May 3 to get someone to guess spider uh superhero and secret identity but then the person looks at it and they put their marker on venom and it ends up that it's actually a assassin and everyone loses now most of the games are team-based where you make a big group on one side and a big group on the other and you're giving clues to your own team but the duet version is actually a competitor cooperative way to play where you're playing one team with another team giving your own players clues and i personally of all of them think codenames duet is the best version no many places are going to say it's a two-player game that is incorrect um nowhere on the box nowhere in the rules does it say it's a two-player game though the base rules as presented are two-player for some reason everyone seems to insist it's a two-player game it is a two-team game that could have any number of players now personally i prefer duet up to about six players once i get more than that then i usually switch over to the basic codenames Another bonus of this game is all the clues can be combined. So you can just kind of mix and match everything and end up with like a massive second of code names cards. And if you want to give it a try, there are free online mm -hmm. versions of the game that can be great to play as well. That was the code names series of games. All right, my next one might break the rules a little bit because I did say that party games to me are quick. 
But to me, this feels like a party game, and that is the Dexterity Flicking Game Pitch Car, where you build a wooden racetrack and you are flicking Crokinole-like Formula One cars around the track with some rules about which you can skip and knocking people off and reshooting and stuff like that. The thing with Pitch Car is if you stick to just the base set, I think you can get a game done in that half an hour time limit or less. The problem is it's really hard to want to just stick with the base set. And you're going to want to buy expansions and ramps and the loop to loop and the, the, I don't even know the hard banks and the crisscross and the figure eight and keep expanding the set. Now, one problem with pitch card that, it, that is always an issue is that the production quality is fantastic and the price is high to match. This is not a cheap game. It is pretty much all wood except for these rubber rails you can put in on some of the pieces and it has a price point to match. It is not a cheap game, but I love pitch car. I love playing it with the, the higher player counts with eight, 12 cars, everyone getting in everyone else's ways and being able to bump into other people. And yes, when I generally play pitch car, I don't set up a quick, easy game. I tend to set up as complicated a track as I can, but you can, if you just stick to the originals, play a nice quick game of pitch car. Now, one of the other issues with pitch car is space. Yeah. Uh, if you you need to not only have enough space to set up the track you want, but also to to sort of maneuver around it to get at, at angles and things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so table heights, table sizes, there's a bunch of different varieties of ways of setting this up that you need to take into account, especially when you start getting in larger player counts and you need to think about people moving around each other to get in mm -hmm. there to play. While it can be fun, it can also be a logistical nightmare. Yeah. But when it works, that's a great game, and that is Pitch Car. Next, uh, I, possibly my favorite party game. It's it, uh, illustrations and concepts are, are so close. This is concept, uh, a game that, that is unfortunately hard to describe and get the concept of unless you see it. Uh, basically, you've got a giant board. You can even buy a giant size version. You've got a pretty big board with a bunch of icons on it, right? Like like icons, like computer icon type of things. So a bunch of symbols all over the board. You're going to draw a clue from a card and you're going to pick it, pick one of the clues. And then you're going to try to get people to guess your clue by using the icons. And you have little plastic pieces to do this, like one for the main concept, another for sub concepts and little tiny cubes to kind of tie things together. And you are trying to use these icons to say, get someone to guess Rocky. So you might put like the concept is a person, a subconcept is a movie. You're going to put something on the, the, the ball baseball bat that means sports. You're going to, there's like a fighting icon. You might put it on that. And all the other players are trying to guess what you're trying to put out there. I know there's rules for teams. The house rule we always play by is whoever guesses the clue first gets to be the next person to give the concept. And we've never kept score or kept, track of how long we're playing we just played until we get sick of concept which one night at extra life involved going through the entire deck of cards yeah no concept is fantastic uh there's also a great uh digital implementation on board game geek uh the concern board game arena board game arena sorry uh the concern i have had with it is that the actual clues sometimes are not as universal uh, and, and and tend to be a little on the dated side yeah. with that game, even though it's not actually that old. It's only a 2013 game. It The, the clues just felt a little dated uh, yeah. and that made it tougher for some people to really kind of uh, dig in. But that was... Yeah, I'll admit, yep. what I would like to see for concept is an updated, like just give me a card expansion. Yep. Give me a, a, a 2020 version concept card pack that I can replace and i know there is a kids version of concept now that's all about animals but i don't know any more than that well and there was a 2020 print and play that came out of concept apparently so i wonder if that might have I, I wonder clues. uh it was it was a, it was a covid uh covid release so uh okay. we'd have to definitely see what the uh clues were like in that one but overall that was concept next i have another telestrations game that is not to be confused with the original because it actually plays quite different that is Telestrations Upside Drawn. This is a team-based version of Telestrations where you're going to break into pairs, up to four pairs and eight players. And the difference in this one is everyone is trying to guess the same word. One player is holding the marker. The other player is moving the board and trying to get the person holding the marker to guess the, 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 the clue, the word. It could be a phrase or whatever. Um, there, it's, it still uses a die to determine 
which categories you have places, things, actions, and sayings, I think are the different ones. Um, this one's neat because there's more going on than you would expect. So in addition to the whole trying to draw by moving a board under someone else, which is its own, got its own issues. And the whole, some people have a hard time drawing upside down or not, or guessing upside down, depending on which way you go. Um, but the my part I really like in this is that it has a bit of a deduction element. And that's because you have to play all sitting in the same area where you can hear the other teams. So you've got this big triangle on your board and you start guessing uh, pyramid, uh, Egyptian, and then you hear someone else go Christmas tree. Oh, and then someone else like holidays. And I'm like, oh, wait, I know it's got to be about trees. So I'm like fir, spruce, forest. And then we win because we guess forest, even though I was originally thinking Egyptian, but I heard all the other teams were talking forest and trees and evergreens. So I thought maybe that's what it was. And I love it when that happens. And honestly, I will admit when I only played this with two pairs, I thought the game was neat. It was okay. And the, the drawing thing was a gimmick. But once we added up to six players and even more so with eight, it's that hearing the other team part that really makes this stand out as really interesting and cool. Right. So uh, as long as you have the opportunity to cheat off your other uh, players, it's <laughs> yes. a great game. It is definitely a much trickier dexterity based mm -hmm. game and has zero influence on whether or not you're a good drawer. Oh, definitely not. And that is Telestration's Upside Drawn. Now this, I say this list isn't in order, but this comes next on purpose. The next game I have is Pictomania. This is a drawing party game um, based on Pictionary, which is why they, they did the pun on the name, by Vlada Shavato, of all people, like as someone who makes heavy Euro, heav heavily thematic Euro games. Well, he made this drawing game, and the thing that's great about this one is, again, it's about deduction. So what happens is you're going to put a clue up on a central board that everyone can see. And there are, say, eight things on it for eight players. Each player is drawing a different one of those things. And you all draw simultaneously. And while you're drawing, you're going to place bets on who you think is drawing the other things. And it's, again, got this kind of neat deduction thing because you're like, I know I'm drawing the duck. And D's obviously drawing a car, which leaves the tiger and the cat and the lion left. Okay, how the heck do I figure out? Wait, that's got stripes, so that's got to be the tiger. That leaves this. I can't tell at all what Genevieve's drawing, but I know the only thing left is this, so that's got to be it. And like, there's to me, this is the gamer's drawing game. This is the the drawing game for people who want the deduction element and the fact that, and again, there's also strategy on not drawing too well. Because if you draw too well, you're going to get guessed out right away, but you still want to get guessed, but you don't want to eliminate it. So if you can draw your thing sort of like someone else's thing while well, getting yours across, that's part of the strategy. Of all the the drawing party games, to me, this is the one that, that Euro gamers are probably going to get a kick out of, which makes sense coming from Vlada. And uh, make sure you, get, you go for the second edition, released in 2018. It does have a few improvements on it. That is Pictomania. Next, we get to another gamer's game to me, a more of a gamer's game, and that is Trap Words. Trap Words is, <clears throat> what is, um, what's the mass market game it's based on? Drawing a complete blank. You can't say the word. Uh, oh. It, it's a gamer version of a very popular mass market party game that I can't remember the name of, and it's driving me nuts. But anyway. So the whole thing with Trap Words is it's got a cool fantasy adventure theme where you're moving through a dungeon trying to kill a boss monster. Thank you, Mountain Papa. Taboo, yes. Sure. I'm like, Taboo is highly popular in Mass Market. Well, this is a gamer's version of Taboo. So you're going through a dungeon, and actually the theme is kind of tied in. There's some interesting stuff with curses and that. But in general, the thing is, is you are trying to get your team to guess a word. The problem is the other team is going to set a number of traps for you, which are words you cannot say while trying to get the other team to guess. The difference between trap words and taboo is in taboo, you know the words you're not allowed to say, and it's kind of like you get buzzed out if you say them. In trap words, the other team picks it, or you pick the traps for your opponents. So you're, there's got that, again, to me, the good party games have that knowing who you're playing with has an impact. And that's where I found in trap words, it comes up a lot, where you're like, well, I know Deanna is giving the clues, and if she's giving the clues for Turtle, she might make a Xanth reference or whatever. Uh, turtle, yeah, Turtle and Xanth reference. I did get that right. 
or Pratchett's Pratchett's hand. Now I'm now I'm messing things up. I'm like, this is what happens when we don't script our our game descriptions before our episodes. But you're gonna base your traps based on who you're playing with, which I think is fantastic. This one I didn't know what to think when I first tried it, and I will admit we fumbled the first couple of games because there's some very restrictive, unique rules about what you can give as clues and what you can't, and who's allowed to say the trap words because the people guessing are allowed to use the trap words, and we messed that up the first game, which actually kind of ruined it. Uh, it's a neat game, worth learning, way more fun than I thought it was going to be, and again, good for gamers. And that was Trap Words. Which I got to kind of roundabout there. <laughs> Next, the oldest game on my list, sort of, um, and that is The Great Dalmudi. The Great Dalmudi is a ladder climbing card game with 13 suits. Um, in this game, you are trying to void your hand of cards, and you're going to deal out the whole deck, no matter how many people are playing, and you're trying to get rid of all your cards. And the way it works is someone's going to lead, and they're going to play a number of cards of the same number so they could play like 13 13s would be ridiculous you'd never have that but they might start with like four 13s well the next player has to play a lower number but the same amount so they have to play four 12s would be going in logic but then the next player could play four sevens and then the next player could play four fours and four fours generally can't be beat but there are jokers and someone could play down two twos and two jokers and steal the trick and, and get rid of their cards now, this game also has some very silly rules, and this is where it's firmly in the party game, is the two players who won the last trick get to be the great Del Moody and the lesser Del Moody, and at the other end, you have the lesser peon and the greater peon. Well, the peons have to give the Del Moody's their greatest cards, and the Del Moody's get to give any cards they want to their peons. So once you're in the great Del Moody seat, you have a big advantage over everyone else. Everyone else are merchants and are allowed to trade one card, so they can all negotiate with each other and make deals. Then you throw in the fun rules, at least in my version of the game. I don't know about the new printing, but in my version of the game, it suggests things like the peons are the ones who have to clear the cards every round and who have to count the tricks. The peons could also be the people who have to go get drinks for everyone or the greater peon doesn't get a chair while they're playing. We have had a lot of fun with this. I realize it sounds kind of abusive, but as long as everyone's on the same page and having fun with it, I think it's really cool. Now, in recent history, and I don't know if it's this year, last year, or sometime before the pandemic started, because we're in quarantine, this game was re-released with a Dungeons & Dragons theme, where you are playing evil minions of some kind of overlord called the Dal Moody. I don't know if the humor is still in there, or if it's just mechanical. I have not checked out this new version. The version I have is from years and years ago, from Richard Garfield, and my cards look like they've been well-played. And I don't plan on replacing it. So I couldn't tell you if the D&D version is, includes things like abusing the peon or not. So a lot of people may know this game. You've probably played in high school and for decades by many other names. Uh, P&A, uh, A-Hole. Uh, there's a lot of different names that this game has gone under. Uh, it's also been released as a Dilbert game yeah. for up to six players. Uh, and yeah, it was 2020, The Great Dal Moody Dungeons and Dragons was now, released. There is a big difference between the ones that use standard deck of cards, though, because you have 13 13s, 12 12s, 11 11s, 10 10s. You can't get that with a standard deck of cards. And that, to me, makes the big difference. I did not em em uh, enjoy President or A-Hole, whereas this I found better. There was more strategy to it. There was, I have six 13s. Do I spend two of them? For one suitor, I put all down all six, and do I save four for later? There was more tactics involved and a little more long-term strategy. Fair enough. It gave, it gave a big chance for the, the peons to actually replace the others by holding on to those low number, or sorry, high number cards and high numbers of them. You could often steal a trick that should have been won by someone else. And that was the Great Del Moody. Next, I have Nitwit. Um, still think I'm the only podcast who ever talks about this game. This is the uh, the Venn diagram uh, party game where you're going to sit there and put a spool out on the board, and then you're going to put a rope around that spool, and you're going to draw a random word and attach it. Next player is going to put another spool out. Then they're going to put a rope around, but the rope has to go around at least one existing spool. You're going to keep doing this so that you have all these spools surrounded by various threads. Each of those threads has a number on it. Once this is done, everyone takes their, their little player card. You start the timer. Well, actually, there's no timer on this. It's first person done grabs a bonus coin. 
you, you you basically say start the round and then everyone looks at each spool and then writes down a word that fits everything that spool is looped by so you could have you could have a green and I, i've drawn blanks on i can't i can't improv tonight <laughs> green and slimy and someone might write frog and then someone else might write green eggs and ham or something and then once everyone's got down a an answer for every word you then go through it you there's a system for voting up or down if you think someone's on it or not like green eggs or ham that's not necessarily slimy and then people argue over, well, no, I thought I think they were pretty slimy. And someone's like, well, I've got the book right here. They don't look that slimy. And then everyone votes if they go with green eggs and ham was legit or not. You get points for getting the most right. You play multiple rounds, player with the most points wins. This one reminds me even a bit of medium, but without that having to tie up, try, um, you know, match up with someone else. Yeah, no, this is definitely an interesting one. And it's strange. It's a 2016 game that really has not gotten a lot of public love out there, despite there being, uh, you know, it, it's a solid game. It's not, you know, super high, uh, highly rated, but uh, it's it's a nice, light, fun game that uh, is best at six players, which is, you know, what we look for a lot of the time in yep. our party games. And that was Knitwit. Now, my final recommendation of games that we enjoy as gamers, party games that we enjoy as gamers who tend to enjoy heavier games, is the sadly long out of print, but wait, there's more. Uh, this is from the Bamboozle Brothers, Sen and Jay. This is one of my favorite games of all time, and I don't know why anyone won't reprint this game. I know Jay and Sen are up for it, so publishers, listen up. Get they, but wait, there's more out there. This is a pitch game. Uh, this is the best pitch game I've ever played where you are going to get a product that is everyone's gets off the table. So everyone, you know, put a product out in the center of the table. Then everyone has a hand of features for that product. You're going to pick one of those features and you're going to start to pitch why people should buy that product with that feature. The thing is 15 seconds or so into your pitch, you're going to say, but wait, there's more and flip over a random feature that you then have to integrate into your pitch. This goes around the table with everyone making their own pitch, all for the same product, but with different features. And then everyone blind votes on who they think gave the best pitch. Now, there is also a catch up mechanic in this called tell me more, which if someone's, you know, doing a little too well and they seem to be struggling, you can play your but tell me more. And part of their, but wait, there's more, they then have to flip over yet another random card and add that into their pitch. This uh, game, I have to admit, is not for everyone. You have to be good at talking on your feet, which I'm obviously failing somewhat tonight. Uh, you got to be good at talking on your feet and improvising and coming up with stuff off the top of your head. But if you've got a group that can do that, you are going to love this. Where this game goes over best with my personal friends and group is with the role players I play with. You get the role players in there and then they get into their snake oil salesman mood and then they just hammer through this game. Yeah, I, I have to say this. I, I've played this one, uh, especially wonderful at like 2 a.m. on Extra Life <laughs> Nights. And it is a fantastic game. It's a shame that no one else has grabbed it since it's been out of publication. And that is, but wait, there's more. All right, next I've got some honorable mentions. Now, these are games that I don't personally own uh, that I would be most likely to buy next. Like if I was going out shopping for party games, this would be my short list, starting with Monstrosity. Yet another drawing game. This one's unique to me, though. I haven't seen anything like this. So you have a deck of monsters, and the clue giver, we'll call it, I'm not sure what's called in the game. Again, I don't own it draws out a monster and then describes the monster to the rest of the players and they sit and listen until the full description is done. Then everyone has to draw what was just described to them, but while doing so, they can ask the clue giver questions like, oh, does it have a big nose or a small nose? You said its mouth is in its chest, like, like up in its pecs or like in its belly, you know, and then at the end, you all show your monster and the one that's closest to the original wins the round and gets whatever points. Again, I don't even know what the scoring is in this game, because like most player games, most people throw that out. This one sounds fantastic to me. There's, I think, two now expansions giving you more monster cards, because I will admit that my one concern with this one is that you will get to know the monsters, and I'm worried that you're going to draw it and go, oh, remember the one with the 18 eyes? It's that one. 
and I, I that would kind of ruin it. But again, I haven't played myself, and I think it's going to take a lot of plays before you get there anyway. Yeah, there are two. Uh, there's a cute creatures and a robots yeah. expansion, and apparently there are some alternative game modes involved in there, including some that can help you play with larger groups, uh, yeah. as well as if you just want to home rule it yourself, because that's totally workable as well. Uh, the witness is the name of the uh, the person who's you know looking at the drawings and looking at the monster, and, and okay. seeing what's that, and that is monstrosity. Next, I have just one. Uh, I feel bad that I don't have this game yet, but to be honest, it came out in the middle of the pandemic and I'm not playing a lot of party games right now, so I haven't rushed to get it. Uh, this is one of the best sounding word guessing games where someone is, you're, you're trying to get one player to guess the answer, the clue. Everyone else is going to provide clues to try to get that word guessed. And the whole thing in this game is if two players provide the same clue, they cancel each other out and they don't get to share it. If everyone's clues cancel everyone out, the guessing person basically has no information to work on. This just sounds fantastic. Excuse me. This just sounds fantastic. I have not heard anyone say anything bad about this game. It seems like a great big group game. Uh, it's honestly on my list to pick up. Once we get back to playing in public big gaming events, I'm going to try to find myself a copy of Just One. So Just One is ranked number three in party games yeah. on Board Game Geek, although it did come out a little bit before the pandemic by two years. So oh, Okay. <laughs> but that was Just One. If I remember, it was impossible to get when it first came out. I think that's what I remember. Anyway, I still don't have a copy. Got to go with that. Next up, I have the pitch game I'm most curious about now that you can't get, but wait, there's more. I already own everything there is for, but wait, there's more. So the next pitch game I have, this one's from Bicycle, the company that makes playing cards, and that is Tattoo Stories. This is one where you have to draw a tattoo based on a pitch, and then you have to sell how your tattoo matches the story it's supposed to tie to. I will admit, again, I don't own this one, but I love the concept of drawing tattoo style art into your pitch and the combination of drawing and pitching in one. To me, that just sounds really cool. Yeah, unfortunately, this game has not gotten a lot of press. And I think a lot of people see the publisher or 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 the publisher isn't getting into the right game stores because it hasn't gotten the yeah. interest that I think, at least from reading the box. And again, I haven't played this one either, but. I've been really intrigued every time I've read about this mm -hmm. game uh, and it's just not gotten any sort of market penetration oh, uh, for what sounds like a great game, but that is tattoo stories. So that's it for our list of party games that we personally enjoy and think you will be enjoyed by hobby board games. You will be enjoyed by hobby board games. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just me tonight. I didn't write that. That's what I want to say that. That's uh, not what it says. There's no you here. Oh, and think will be enjoyed by hobby board game. Well, it doesn't make any sense. Will be enjoyed by hobby board gamers. That, there should be your gamers. <laughs> so that's it for our list of party games wow. that we personally enjoy and think will be enjoyed by hobby board gamers. There we go. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. If you've got a question for us, head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or hit me up on social media where I can be found as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. We're going to a review of the Telestration's 12-player party pack from the up, who we have to thank for sending us a review copy of this game to check out. So the Telestration's 12-player party pack was published by the Op in 2011 as a re-implementation of their highly popular party game, Telestrations, originally published two years earlier in 2009. Now, this new version of Telestrations has a player count of 4 to 12 players, includes 600 new words, and features a very reasonable price of $39.99. And as a party game, the higher player count built into the game is highly sought after. Now, Telestrations features the subtitle, The Telephone Game Sketched Out, and that's a pretty apt description. This is a formalized game version of Eat Poop You Cat or The Telephone Game, where players get a clue, attempt to draw that clue, then pass their books to the next player, who has to guess what was drawn. 
This is then passed to the next player who draws an image based on the last player's guess, alternating between drawing and guessing until the book gets back to the original player. While the game does include two different scoring systems, this party game is much more about the fun and laughs than figuring out who won. One of the things that did change a bit in this new edition of Telestrations is the component quality. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you check out the Telestrations 12 player party pack unboxing video on YouTube. So the thing, first thing you will notice with this 12 player version of Telestrations is of course the fact there's 12 books and each book has 12 pages. The next thing that I noticed though is that this version features fine point markers which I think are a big improvement over the fat markers included in the original game. Now, along with this, you get very clear and easy to learn from instructions, some cloth erasers, a pack of clues that actually matches the original game. They're identical. And then a separate pack, sealed pack of new clue cards and a card holder that thankfully fits both of these decks. There's also a custom six-sided die for determining which clues you should be using and a sand timer. The fine point pens make a big difference, even if you're not much of an artist, as you just get a bit more flexibility in your design, be it a stickman or a shaded piece of artwork. Now, for those not familiar with illustrations, how about you quickly go over how you play? So each player takes a book, a marker, an eraser, and one card. Everyone writes their name in the front of the book. Players then, as a group, decide if they want to use this side or that side of the cards and someone rolls the die. This indicates what everyone's clue is for the round. Everyone writes this down on the front of their book and then flips to the first blank page. What happens next depends on the player count. With an even number of players, you start drawing the clue you just wrote down, but with an odd number of players, you pass the book first and then start drawing the clue on the previous page. So as you always want to ensure that when it comes around, you're getting it at the right point. Correct. Now, the drawing rules are simple. You have one minute until the timer runs out to draw what you can. Don't use any letters or numbers. That's it. Once done drawing, you're going to flip to the next page of your book and pass it to the next player. Now, everyone has to guess what the drawings represent. Once everyone runs down their guess, they flip to the next page and pass the book. Players then look back, read the last guess, try to draw that, and so on. And you keep going back and forth until everyone gets their own book back. Then, one by one, players hold up their books and play Vanna White and show everyone the progression from page one to the page of the player count, which should result in lots of laughter. So, you get the clue, the draw, guess, draw, guess, and the first player should end up with a guess at the end to compare with the original clue. Yes, and that's why you have the different timing for odd or even number players, so that the last one is always a guess. Now, Telestration includes two different scoring systems. There's the friendly scoring and the competitive scoring, though competitive and telestrations to me is a little silly. Now, the friendly scoring is based on players picking their favorite sketches, their favorite guests, and getting a bonus point if the book came back and the last clue matches the original clue. The competitive scoring awards points for guesses that match the original clue or the last guess, sketches that help a guesser make a guess, and again, if the last guess gets matches the original clue, you get a bonus point. You'll recognize some of these similar scoring systems if you played any of the digital Jackbox drawing games. All right, now that everyone knows how to play, let's move on to our thoughts about this game. So I have been a fan of Telestrations for a long time, and I have owned the original eight-player version for many years now. In that time, I've also gotten to play with other people's copy of the 12-player version of the game, and I have had it on my list to pick up at some point, but never did so. So I do have to thank the op for finally giving me an opportunity to basically upgrade from the eight player to the 12 player version of Telestrations. I honestly can say that I have never laughed playing any board game, any game as hard as I have playing Telestrations. This is a fantastic party game that I have enjoyed playing with gamers of all ages from young kids to seniors. Now, one of the best things about this game is how much fun it can be when things go wrong and well, how awesome it can feel when you get your book back and that final guess actually matches your clue. Due to the fact the game is just as much fun when it goes right as when it goes wrong means this is great for players of all levels of artistic skill. Now, another thing that makes this game fun, even for people who can't draw, is due to that one minute time limit, even people who are fantastic artists generally don't have enough time to draw well and pull upon all their skills. 
in many games, a simple stick figure will be more effective at getting the message across than a complex drawing. It's much more about conveying simple gross concept than mm -hmm. fine little details. In some ways, too much artistry can hurt as the player has too much to think about when guessing <laughs> what you might have meant. Now, another aspect that I like about telestrations is that players don't actually really have to know what the clues mean in order to draw them. This is what makes the game approachable for younger kids and makes it more approachable in general than you would think. Note on the other end of the spectrum, not talking about kid-friendly, is this game can often go blue when playing with adults. For people that are really into a more adult game, you even have a Telestrations After Dark edition of the game, but that's not what we're talking about here. And to be fair, most adults who choose to don't need a After Dark version True. to make things a little risque anyways. Even the most innocent of clues can be shifted naughty should you choose. All right, so we love the system in Telestrations. Now, what sets this 12 ver player version apart from the original, aside from player count? Well, yeah, that's the most obvious, right? It plays 12 players instead of eight. Every book has 12 pages long, so there's 12 books, so 12 people can play simultaneously with one box. Next up are the thinner markers we already mentioned. Like, I gotta admit, there is some appeal to the fat-headed markers because it, again, helped to balance the skilled artists versus the doodlers. But everyone I've actually asked says, no, 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 the thinner ones are better. And actually, I know a lot of people who took the original version and just upgraded them with thinner markers bought elsewhere. Now, I also appreciate the fact 600 new clues. That is not a small amount. That's 50 new cards. I played Telestrations enough times that I think I've seen all the original cards and many of them multiple times. So it's nice to have some surprises shown up, shown up especially when playing with people who played the game as often as I have. You're never going to go wrong with adding more clue variety into guessing games, especially now when you're using 12 clues per game. And technically a full game is three rounds. So you're looking at 36 clues per game right. with, a, with a max player count. The only parts of Telestrations I admit that I don't love are is the one minute time limit and the scoring rules. But both of these are honestly extremely easy to fix. As for us, especially when playing with the kids or other people's kids, younger players, we find the one minute time limit a little too short. So what I do is I steal the timer rule from Race for the Galaxy for our game nights where everyone starts drawing and only when one player is finished do they start the timer for the rest of the players. With intermediate players, we do it even more so where at any point someone can start the timer, but it doesn't start until one of the players chooses to get it counting. This is one of those harmless house rules and can easily be changed in a variety of ways, depending on the group you're with. After all, most of us carry a digital timer with us everywhere we go nowadays to customize the timer. Now, as for scoring, we found the friendly scoring to be much more fun. And I've only used the competitive scoring a couple of times, mainly just to try it out. Or when we happen to have that one player who needs to know who won. Most games, though, we skip both. We use the time that would be spent flipping back through the books and giving out points, to play another round. Like many party games, the points here are rather arbitrary, arbitrary, They're rather arbitrary and really don't matter. The goal of the game is to have fun. And if you do that, you win. Or it like whose line is it anyways? Throw some points around and the winners are everyone who had fun playing. Totally agree. Overall, I've loved Telestration since I first played it many years ago, and that has not changed. This is not a game I got tired of. This is a game we continue to play, and I don't expect that to change anytime soon. As for the 12-player party pack, it's an overall improvement on the original game, featuring higher player count, better components, and more clues. You really can't go wrong. If you're looking to pick up Telestrations for the first time, just go right out, grab the 12-player party pack. Even if your group isn't that big, if you don't even know, think you'll ever play with tall players, even if you just have four people going to play with illustrations, I still recommend you pick this one up for the additional clues and the better components. Plus, you never know when some extra guests might show up and you need a larger group game. For people who own the original, do you think it's worth upgrading? Honestly, that's a tough call. Uh, I own both now. I have both copies of the game. Um, I, I honestly think you should pick up the party pack and then donate your original copy to a less fortunate gamer, a library, a school, or make it someone's lucky value village find in the future where they can share that they got this great game for three bucks. Give it to someone else who will share some love. 
I don't think keeping both copies makes more sense. It's not like, well, I only have eight players today, so I'm going to use the old version. Doesn't make sense to me, but I think it's worth picking up the new one. Like, that's just the one you should have. There really is no drawback to having the 12 player set, even if you aren't mm -hmm. sure you'll ever have that many players. Now, as for people who are just learning about this game for the first time, I don't know where you've been, but I strongly think it's worth checking out. I'm not a big party game fan. I, I'm like a medium to heavy Euro fan, and I, my, my collection of party games is pretty small, and they don't come out all the time, but they come out a couple times a year for specific game nights, and Telestrations has been one of those games that I don't expect will ever leave that part of my collection. Well, that's it for our review of Telestration's 12-player party pack. Have you played Telestrations? We would love to hear what you think about this game in the comments. When you have the time, I also invite you to check out the written review over at TabletopBellhop.com. Now, speaking of checking out TabletopBellhop.com for more Telestrations content, I invite you to check out our reviews of the new Telestrations 80s and 90s expansion pack featuring 50 new cards, featuring 600 new words and phrases, and our review of Telestrations Upside Drawn, a funky team-based version of Telestrations. Welcome to our review of the rad new Telestrations 80s 90s expansion pack from The Op, who we have to thank for sending us a copy of this expansion pack to check out. So the Telestrations 80s and 90s expansion pack is the first official expansion for Telestrations, featuring 50 new cards that can be added to any edition of Telestrations. This expansion was published by the Op in 2021. This small card pack has an MSRP of $12.99. Now, Telestrations 80s and 90s expansion pack has 600 new words and phrases spread over 50 cards with 80s clues on one side and 90 clue, 90s clues on the other. Now, a copy of some version of Telestrations is required to use this expansion. Now, for a look at these new cards, I invite you to check out our Telestrations 80s and 90s expansion pack unboxing over on YouTube. I gotta say, this is one of my shortest unboxings I've ever done because there really isn't a lot in this expansion. It's a single card pack that includes new clue cards and two rule cards, including one optional rule variant. Not quite as short as some promo pack unboxings, but close. Now, that being said, you don't need a lot of time to show off, even with all this densely packed content. So, how do we use these new cards with our existing copies of Telestrations? So using this expansion can't really be any easier. You basically decide if you want to use it or not. You can either decide to use all these new cards, all the, they call them the decade cards, or mix them in with your existing cards. Now, the 80s sides represent this side, and the 90s sides represent that side when determining which clues you're going to use. Now, 80s clues include things like mixtapes, Where's the Beef, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and Claymation, whereas 90s clues include things like Lunchables, Booyah, The Matrix, and Mallrats. Now, one nice touch that I do like here is they included band names for song names, and also a few other cues like Broadway Musical for Cats. And they do make it clear that you don't need to include the band name or extra information in your guess. It's just there to help you remember who wrote Jump, the Pointer Sisters or Van Halen. Now, due to the fact everyone's knowledge of these pop culture references will vary, the new optional rule allows players who don't know what their specific clue is, the one that got ruled, to instead choose another card, uh, another option on the same card. So you don't want your 11-year-old trying to figure out how to draw I Pity the Fool when they have likely never seen Mr. T in their lives. All right, so what did you think once you actually got in some games using these new cards? So as a child of the 70s, who was a kid in the 80s and went through my teen years in the 90s, I love these new cards. Um, as you can see in our unboxing, even reading off the first card from the box, I was smiling and happy. I was like, oh, yeah, this is perfect. I get it. Whoever picked these words and phrases did a great job in their selection. All right. Well, now, while I'm certain that with only 300 clues from each decade, someone will be upset that this didn't get included or wondering why that was included. Mm -hmm. You can't please everyone all the time, but they've done a spectacular job with the, in the limits of the production run. Now, that said, I am glad there's the new optional rule. 
as even living through both these eras, there were some clues on some of the cards I actually didn't recognize. And it was nice to be able to officially skip them and pick a different clue. Now, I'm pretty sure that with our group, if that rule wasn't there, we probably would have come up with a similar house rule anyway, but it's nice to make it official. Yeah, no, it's a party game. If you're not having fun, something needs to be fixed. Now, the one potential problem with this impact expansion pack came up when I decided to see how well it worked for my kids. So I, I, I gave it some thought before sitting down to play, and I was thinking, due to the nature of Telestrations, the way Telestration plays, that my kids should be able to play with these even if they don't understand the reference. Well, I was thinking my girls could surely come up with a drawing for whatever the clue was without actually knowing the reference. This, unfortunately, didn't play out as well as I had hoped. Um, as Sean mentioned with Mr. T, or while well, you can pretty easily come up with drawings for, say, Clerks or Clueless, even if you don't know both of those are movies, it's pretty hard to come up with a drawing of U2 or Air Jordans if you don't actually know the reference. Now, to be fair, I am certain the target market here is not <laughs> kids that are teens right now. And I think most people picking this up are going to be pe people familiar with the two decades that are featured in it. So I'm not considering this a knock against the expansion at all, but it is something to be aware of. If like me, you thought maybe oh, I'll get this and my kids will still be able to use it. You're probably not going to be able to toss these in every game you play. It's easy enough to overestimate the applicability of experiences and how they impact our knowledge of the material. I'm sure even the region you live in will have a strong mm -hmm. impact and you may have in fact just completely missed some experiences that others consider universal. Now an actual complaint I have about this expansion, it's a small one, is what do I do with this now? How, how do I store this? Unfortunately, these cards don't fit into the card holders that come with any of the currently in print versions of Telestrations, nor is there really a good place to, to put these in the box, in the original game box. Now, I will say, for those of you with the 12-player party pack that comes with the extra 300 cards, you can, if you put those in the box, you now have a gap in the insert that you could probably fit these in, but they won't fit in with the box. And there's a little bit more than 300 cards here with the rules, so they tend to slide around a bit. So it's just not perfect. Um, you, you can almost fit it. And honestly, I can't fault the op for this. Like this expansion came out long after the original game was released. I'm sure they didn't know it was coming when, when they planned the box insert for Telestrations. And honestly, if they had left a gap for expansions, I'm sure there'd be people out there complaining, why, is, why don't my cards fit in this holder and why are they loose and why is there a gap? So this isn't a deal breaker, but it is, just a, it is just something that bothered me as a gamer who likes to keep their games all organized and sorted and in, in perfect shape, right? Just it, it bugs my 5S quality brain. It really is a minor quibble, if one that does need to be noted. Overall, I love this small box. Uh, cheap expansion, right? Nice. Cheap expansion. Adds some fantastic 80s and 90s clues to a game I already love. Um, as a Telestrations fan, and especially as someone who lived through the two decades highlighted in here, I'm extremely happy with this pack. Honestly, any Telestrations fan that's old enough to remember the 80s and 90s should just go pick this up. I don't see any reason why you would. Where I'm not sure is with younger gamers. I don't know how many younger gamers we have listening to our show, but you're awesome if you do. I don't know how much you can get out of this expansion unless you're a real history buff or you know, you're a fan of a specific period. Uh, the clues here can be really specific. And while there's a useful optional rule to help people who may not get all of the references, I worry younger gamers are gonna have a good chance. The younger the gamer is, the more chance, you're not gonna recognize any of the things on one of the cards. So it might also be a chance for you to bombard your kids with all the 80s media you can in an attempt to train them. There you go. That's it. After we're done, Telestrations, we're going to sit down and you're going to let me know all the ones you didn't get. And we'll fix that by next week. Well, that's it for our review of the 80s and 90s expansion pack for Telestrations. When you have time, I also invite you to check out the written review over at TabletopBellhop.com. Now, for even more Telestrations content, I invite you to check out our reviews of the Telestrations 12-player party pack and our review of Telestrations Upside Drawn, a rather strange team-based version of Telestrations, which unfortunately isn't compatible with this expansion. Welcome to a review of Hughes and Cues, a color-based party game from The Op, who we have to thank for sending us a copy of this game to check out. 
Hughes and Cues was designed by Scott Brady and published in 2020 by The Op. This colorful party game plays three to ten players, with games taking about half an hour, depending on how long everyone deliberates on the cues. This party game has an MSRP of $24.99 US. If you've got some AP prone folks, I sense a timer might be required. <laughs> it can be an issue. Now, in Hues and Cues, players are trying to guess a specific color on a grid of 480 colors based on a one word and then two word cue. Players get points for how close their guesses are to the target. To get a look at this large, vibrant board and the other components in Hues and Cues, check out our unboxing video on YouTube. So the component quality here is decent, and I would say on par with most mass market party games. It includes a mounted board, 30 pawns, a huge deck of colored cards, each featuring four different colors, and a cardboard frame that's used for scoring. Rules are short, concise, and very clear. Pretty much what you'd expect from the box. No better, no worse. Now that we have an idea of what you get in the box, how about you teach us to play Hues and Cues? So this will be a pretty quick one. Hues and Cues is dead simple to learn and play. Every player takes two pawns in their color and places the third on the score track. Starting player draws a card and picks one of the four colors in their card to be their cue color for the round. They then give a one-word clue. The other players then, in clockwise order, place a pawn on one of the spots on the board that they think best matches the cue given. Once everyone's placed their pawn, the first player then optionally gives a second clue, which can now be one or two words. Then everyone places their second pawn based on this cue, and you score. Cue giver passes to the next player, and you play until everyone has had two turns giving cues. So give a word, guess, give two words, guess, score. Not rocket science here, folks. And scoring is just as simple. After everyone's placed their pawns, the cue giver places this little cardboard frame around their chosen color. The frame covers a three by three square section of the grid. Players all get points based on where their pawns are in relation to this grid, with three points for being in the middle, two points for being along the inside edge, and one point touching the outside edge. The cue giver then gets one point per pawn inside of the frame. At the end of the game, the player with the most points wins. Now that we all know how to play, how would you share some of your thoughts? on Hues and Cues. So I first learned about this game during one of the many online game conventions I checked out during the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic. And after watching one live stream of a game being played, I knew I had to get a copy of this game at some point. This is one of those games where I can't help but wonder what took so long? Like, like how did someone not have this out yet? The basic concept is so simple, straightforward and elegant that it's hard it took this long to exist as a formalized game. Like I just taught you everything you need to know how to play in a matter of moments. The game is just that straightforward. And from the look of the game, for some folks, quite attention getting. I know I wanted to play it just from looking at the board without having any idea how you played. Now, the real question though is, is it fun? And based on the games we played, yes, it is. Though I have to say the game isn't as easy and simple as I expected it to be. The difficulty the groups I played it with have had is coming up with those cues, the, the clues, what people have to guess. Now, this includes coming up for cues for less common colors, as well as trying to come up with unique cues for the common ones. Like, I honestly haven't played a game of hues and cues yet where someone didn't say sky for some version of blue. And every game we played have had multiple players taking a very long time to come up with their cues. And unless you all work for Pantone or a paint company, you're probably going to struggle some. But then mm. that's part of the fun. Trying to think of something that is not only that color, but uniquely right. that color. Fire shocks being one of those tricky ones, for instance, that can be different colors in different places. Personally, I've been thinking about it since we've been playing, especially with some players that had a real difficult time coming up with clues, was I, I almost wish they had simple one-word cues listed with each of the colors in the cards, or maybe even just one of the four colors. Now, I do worry this may lead to players just using those cues and not improvising, and possibly people memorizing them, though so I don't know, there's a huge deck, I think that'd be difficult. I just think having something there for inspiration might help people get their minds moving in the right direction. I'm not sure I like that solution, but perhaps a clue book 
where you could reference your color you if you were stuck, but it didn't automatically shape your clues by being right in front of you and kind of staring yeah. in your face. And of course, adding in a clue, a, a hue book of example colors that would probably greatly increase the price of the game. I don't want that. Now, getting back to how I discovered hues and cues, right? I, one of the things that I think is, is important to highlight, especially nowadays, and with the popularity of online gaming growing, popularity and sometimes necessi necessity of online gaming going, is how well this game plays online. Now, I watch multiple streams of people playing this game because it fascinated me. And most of the games I watched, the streamers were not playing at the same table. And I saw two different great ways to accommodate playing online. Now, the one group had the player owning the game hold up the cue card to the camera while everyone else closed their eyes. Everyone closed their eyes, just Dave look. And then Dave, you got it. Okay. And then you put the card down, right? There's that way, um, which, which worked pretty well. And then another group just ditched the cards. And I thought that was cool too, because it just let the players pick a color out of their head. So in a way, I like that better because then you can come up with a cue. Like you're like, I want to do something about orcs. And you pick a specific green in your head and then find it on the board, right? And this works due to the fact the board's based on a coordinate system. So it's really easy to say, well, my guess is C13 and put the frame over C62. Yeah. And uh, Hughes and Hughes was even a 2020 Golden Geek Best Zoomable Game nominee. I that's even a category now. It just shows <laughs> how much gaming's changed the last couple of years. Now, I do have one minor complaint about the uh, quality of the game. It's in regards to the mounted board, like it's nice. It, it folds nice. There's no ripples in it. It's a nice board, but it's very glossy. And glare can be an issue with this game because you're talking about colors. We actually found that under certain lighting, like the pot lights in my game room, compared to, say, the side lamp at my mother-in-law's, where you're sitting and where the glare was would actually affect how the colors look. Like if the glare was over your color, it seemed to be brighter and lighter than if it wasn't, right? Just kind of makes sense. Um, that the, it, it is a shiny board. It is almost reflective. And I've got to say, I've been really tempted to hit my copy with a coat of testers dull coat. And I would love to know if anyone out there owns this game and they've done it, did it work? Because I also don't want to ruin my game. So I'm slightly concerned about using it, but I, I would love something to remove that, that hot light glow that ends up on parts of the board while playing. And also, since we haven't said this in a while, pot lights over your gaming table are bad. Yeah, well, it was a pool <laughs> table that was in there when we moved in and we replaced it with a gaming table. So <laughs> maybe the pot lights were great for pool, but I agree with Sean. They are not great, especially when we're trying to do photography or anything like that. All right, overall, despite a few, honestly, very minor quibbles, Hughes and Cues is a great game. I'm not a big fan of party games in general, but I'm always happy to find one that myself and my group find interesting and enjoy. And I don't own a lot of party games, but I'm happy to have cues and clues as part of that small collection. Also, I like games that do something different, and I don't know a lot of games based around color. And I enjoyed exploring that twist on a party game. If you're a party game fan, honestly, you should just be rushing out to pick up cues and cues. This goes for gamers as well as non-gamers, though I doubt there's many non-gamers listening to us. But this is one of those games that's great for gamers and non-gamers alike. It's so easy to approach. It's extremely simple and elegant, and it honestly does something different from most other party games. I think this is a great game to toss into your collection with those other word, trivia, and take that party games. Now, if you're more of a hobby Euro gamer like me, I also suggest you check out Hughes and Cues, just because it may win you over as it has me. You basically already know how to play and should be able to tell if this might be a good game for your group, but there's just aspects of this game that appealed more than your usual take that game. Now, if you're looking for a detailed colored based game that requires you to know Pantone color codes or CYK values or hexadecimal codes, you're not going to find this here. This is a light party game featuring colors that doesn't go into any more depth than what color red do you think of when I say Macintosh? And that's it for our review of Hughes and Cues. If you've tried this color based party game, we'd love to hear from you in the comments. And also, I invite you to check out our written review over at TabletopBellhop.com. And now, the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at games we played since last episode. Uh, before I get to that, just, uh, Deanna, is AB1010 a legal clue? I know what color that I could pick that one out pretty well. 
That is our tabletop bellhop red. You can see around the borders here. All right. Not a lot of game plays this week. There was a lot of other stuff going on. We didn't get in as much gaming as we'd like, including school drama. I got to have a medical procedure done. It was not a fun week except for Friday night. So Friday night, we uh, sat down and we're going to play a couple games and then play Tartar Zone. Well, it didn't work out that well. Uh, the first game I broke out was Tales from the Loop, the board game, which we uh, thank you freely for sending us a review copy. Uh, this is a board game version, in my opinion, it's a board game version of the Tales from the Loop role-playing game. It is someone trying to convert that role-playing game to a board game experience and having mixed success. Now, for people who don't know Tales from the Loop, this is a kids on bikes, E.T., Stranger Things, Goonies, uh, young kids in the 80s that never was. So you are in the Malaren Islands in Sweden, where they have built a large Hadron Collider. Most of your parents work there. Most of the cities employed by the loop in some way. And well, things haven't been the same since they turned it on, including walking robots and dinosaurs and time travel and portals and all kinds of other funky things. In this game, you are playing the kids, trying to solve a mystery. Every Tales from Loop adventure is some type of mystery. The game includes, I think it's six scenarios, don't quote me on that, but a number of scenarios, including one open world, one that you can play multiple times. We played through the first scenario, Bot Amok. Uh, we tried to play through the first scenario, Bot Amok. We, we fumbled through the first scenario, Bot Amok, um, with five hours of play. So we played the game for quite a while maybe even up six hours of play for like about two hours. And then we realized we messed up big, like, like really big. Like we, we, for one, we picked two kids that had the same skills, which just doesn't make sense. And I just totally missed the fact that the game came with multiple kids that had the same skill set, which surprised like they have different weaknesses, but same strengths. And I'm like, Oh, the boards are color coded. So pro tip, if you're playing tails fruit, make sure everyone grabs a different colored board which most board gamers are going to notice, but I didn't realize there were duplicates because there's not duplicates for all the skills. So that was a big mistake. The bigger one is we let the, wa the robots wander out into the water, which I didn't really see anything in the rules that said why not. But the problem is you had to go and interact with them and the kids can't go out in the water because there's no water locations. But like we had them out in the water for a while. Uh, so we messed up and we restarted. Um, I, I don't want to say too much here. I don't want to spend too long on it. Uh, you're a patron. You can listen to our last Sunday brunch. I kind of went on a rant about this. This game is trying to do too much and too, too, too much for the average hobby board gamer, in my opinion. Um, role players are usually much more interested in minutia, counting numbers, checking skills and things like that. And, and dice probabilities than many board gamers are. And this is trying to do all that in board game form. And it, it's to me is too much. Um, you don't actually role play. Uh, the dice odds are kind of terrible if you don't push and pushing hurts your character. Um, one of the ways we described it was in a role playing game, failure is interesting. Something, it progresses the story, something happens. Well, in this, when you fail, just bad things happen. It's, it's not rewarding in any way. But they, by trying to force in all these role playing elements where you're playing kids you have obligations. You have chores you have to complete. You have to start every day at school. You have to be home for dinner at night while trying to solve a mystery that at the beginning of the game, you don't even know what you're doing. Like in the beginning of bottom muck, all you know is there's a robot over there that's stuck and it's not moving. And one of your tasks is to go check it out. And then, well, once you check it out, stuff starts to happen. But you don't even know how to win or lose the game. You're trying to manage that. And then it's an action point economy where you have six actions each turn and everything you try to do takes a certain number of cubes and you're trying to optimize your cubes. And then you pr get presented with a problem. To solve the problem, you're using your skills and you can help each other. But then if it's your weaknesses involved, you can't help. You're going to roll a bunch of dice and all that count, it's D6 dice, all that counts if you roll one six. You're going to grab anywhere from one to say eight dice and roll them looking for one six. And if you fail, you can spend one of your cubes, but it hurts you. Like you, you take a, a complication. You would then roll that. And, and I, thankfully the rule book actually includes the odds at five, which honestly the, the average number of dice we rolled while playing over five hours was five dice. You only have a, like a 58% chance to succeed on that first roll. 
Now, once you push, it's up to 81, but that's still a 19% chance to fail. That's a lot of failures for a board game. And there's way more to it. Like you can hack the robots. You have to try to avoid the robots. You can combine your items. That, that part's really neat. Every item lists three other items it can be combined with to give you an automatic success. So like you can combine your lighter with the hairspray to cause an explosion. I'm like, that's cool. But it didn't come up that often. And just overall, it was fiddly, like, like really fiddly, but also fun. Like, like if you're willing to put the effort to win, man, does this game do a great job of capturing the feel of a kid who has too much on their shoulders, who has to solve it on their own because the parents are useless and trying to solve the mystery and save the island or whatever while still getting your homework done. Like it, it really did give that Tales from the War Loop world feel, but I kind of wish this was more disconnected from the role-playing game. Like I, it just, they, they tried too hard to make this the role-playing game in board game format where I think they could have used a different dice pool system, some simpler mechanics, maybe limit some of the options instead of trying to give it that open world feel. I think it's trying to do too much and more than the average board gamer is going to want to invest more time in learning and fiddling than, than most people are going to enjoy. Now, one thing I've seen mentioned a lot is the poor quality of the rule book is that a, a kickstarter I, thing that's been fixed since in your copy or are you seeing some issues so the, the problem book? the problem i had was i read it and it made perfect sense like i read it and went wow this sounds kind of cool there's all these things you can do oh i like how they integrated this and i'm like wow there's a lot here to read we're gonna have to reference it referencing it at the table it was terrible and i don't know what they could have done better like there is even an index and you would think with an index it would be easy uh, but the problem is it's one of those games of fantasy flight used to be famous for this where they hid rules in the middle of other things and honestly in my opinion you should never have a rule in a sidebar the sidebar should be clarification or calling something out and this has rules hidden in the sidebars so like you've got the whole section on injuries and consequences and what happens with your cubes over in the top right corner is a whole thing that says sick days or staying home sick that explains what happens if all your complication boxes are filled because it came up in our game. Like all of our complication boxes are filled. And as far as I can tell, I'm grounded. I'm going to go to school in the morning. I won't have enough cubes to get home. So my parents will be pissed off. So I will still be grounded. And because I'm grounded, I don't have any cubes to spend to rest. So I can't ever heal myself. And I'm stuck in an infant loop, not able to play. And we're like, that can't be right. There's got to be something. And we Googled it, we looked online, we were on Board Game Geek, we're in the rule forums, and eventually Deanna found it on like a sidebar on page 18, this whole little sidebar about staying home. And I'm like, like three of us looked at this. The further complicate things, this was a Kickstarter. They released a rule book with the Kickstarter. Then they released it on Tabletopia. Then they released a print and play. The rules changed between all three of those. Then the game was finally published. The retail version was released. Everyone got their copies. Backers got their copies. The rule book had changed again. And when trying to Google rules and watch it played videos, like there is an FAQ interview with the designer, but he's using the prototype version. And it changed enough and enough significant ways. It's just a mess. And I noticed people doing how to play videos of the retail version using rules from the prototype. So they probably played it on Tabletopia and are now trying to show it off, not realizing the rules had changed. But as someone with a retail copy, it's very frustrating when I'm like, I watch one video, it says one thing. I watch another video, it says another. Now, as for the rule book quality, on Board Game Geek, there's, what did we figure out the other day? 79 threads of rule questions or something like yeah. that. The designer is actively involved and has answered every question. And in every case, he was able to point to the exact rule in the rule book that solved the question. Now, the fact he had to do that 79 times is a problem. But it's all in there. So, like, like the rule book has it all. And while you're looking at a board game, like the Tales from the Role-Playing Game rule books, like, you know, 600-page hardcover. I almost feel like this should have been thicker somehow or repeated it. I, I don't know. This, this one's odd. I, I kind of feel like when we played the Fallout board game where I'm like, the Fallout board game is really cool, but it's not all at once. And some people are going to love it and some people are going to hate it. Um, there's also a localization issue. This was published by a Swedish publisher and only presents the Swedish version of the loop in the town of Malaren with all the Swedish names. Whereas with the role-playing game, 
They presented a U.S. Denver location as well. They didn't do that with the board game. So I have a feeling just that is going to turn off some North American gamers because it's not situated in areas they know with words they're familiar with. No, that's fair. And I know they are talking about putting a uh, an FAQ and uh, updated rules on the Free League website, but I don't think it's actually it's not there, there yet. yet. No, uh, it wasn't there yet. The, I know the February, latest rule book is there. February 18th, they were saying they were going to start updating stuff uh, on there, but I haven't seen yeah. I haven't seen it up there. So. so Deanna's pointing out, I thought it was fine in Sweden. I think the problem I have with it is the fact it's 80s, and I know North American 80s, not Swedish 80s. But I think that's the difference, though obviously there's a lot of overlap, like going to the video store and all that fits, but I, I have no idea what the program the Spiders thing had to do with anything, if that was even an 80s reference. And it just being able to pronounce things on the board, which I realize, yes, I should learn to pronounce these things and try to do it, but it's it, it can definitely see it turning off people. Overall, though, again, I, I feel bad for hacking it this much. We've only played once. Well, I'd say one and a half times. We played part of a game, restarted and played through. I really need to play it more. I have a feeling there are people I game with, Sean included, that will love this game once we have all the rules figured out. Once we've we've ironed out the wrinkles, I think we're going to love this. But I don't think it's for everyone. Like this is this is not a game that I'm going to throw out very many top ten lists. It might be on a best license game list, but that's about it, right? Like this isn't it. And and the other thing is, as Deanna points out in the chat, like if, if you're trying to recreate the role playing game. I, I have the role-playing game. Like, let's just go play that instead of playing this board game version. I don't mind GMing, right? The problem with the role-playing game is, of course, you have to have, you know, unless you're doing a one-shot, I'm going to steal the scenarios and use it. And my role-playing game will be set in Sweden so I can use the board. Like, that might be a whole way I end up using this game that it wasn't intended for. Yeah, interestingly, uh, it's rating actually rather well on Board Game Geek, but because it was a Kickstarter, I think we can su suspect. Yeah, there tends to if, be some bias. If you, have, some... if you have spent a significant amount of money and time waiting for this game, you are incentivized then to learn it yes. for better or worse. <laughs> no, I agree. I, 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 we had fun. Like, like playing a board game where your scenario is go hack this robot and it's two squares away and we want to make sure everyone's got the right skills and we're going to combo my bike with your cables to be able to tow the thing and get it all together to have the jock in the group go, sorry, man, I can't do it today. I got to go to hockey practice. Like I say, there's no role-playing elements, but like that was a legit line said during a game because the jock had the chore hockey practice and it was nearing Friday. And if they didn't have it done, they were going to be grounded for two weeks and lose their bike, which was their key item. Like, and, and like that actually came up. And the fact that, that's what makes me want to keep trying and keep playing it is, is that moment was awesome. And, but the hour or more we spent Googling rule solutions, not so much. Yeah. And it sounds like uh, realistically the biggest problem with this game is the rule book. Um, and, 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 and whether or not it's, it's for, you know, who it's for may not yeah. be as clear as possible, but even if you are the, the target market for the game, you still have to manage to understand it properly. But can you imagine, to to can you imagine someone watch the Amazon series walking in a store going, Oh, I really like that series. Let's pick up this board game. Right. And they're not gamers. Like I just can't say, yeah. I, I just, I can't see that going over well. Yep. So Deanna, another quote from the game. Well, not quote from the game. I had to convince the other kids to spend money at the local video store or else it would close. And then I would no longer be able to get free rides from my parents because I'd be using the car rides to go fetch rentals once a week. <laughs> like that's part of the game. Like, like it, it did a great job of getting the kids and bikes things. Right. I don't know that. I think it should have been simpler somehow. And, and to be honest, based on the prototype, they did simplify things. It used to be that each of the actions were limited to certain numbers. Like you could only walk so many times or you could only hack once per round and all that's gone. Now you just, you have six cubes, use them for whatever you want. So that's at least one way I've seen it, them simplify it, but it feels like, I don't know what they could have done, but something just, just to like, yes, it's very cool that you have rules for all these things. And yes, it kind of adds a level of similitude, but did we really need that in our board game? All right, next up, we finished that, and I'm like, let's play Charterstone. We got to continue our campaign, and, and 
Tori in particular is like, no, it's like my brain hurts. That, <laughs> that, that, that was, that was frustrating trying to figure out that last game. And, and we we spent too long looking. I don't want to think that much. And I'm like, all right, fair enough. So I broke out a game we all know and love and have played multiple times together, going back to the prototype, and that was Gorinto from Grand Gamers Guild. Um, I, I expected to be talking about this game like Azul because we'd be playing it so much. And I think it's just because we haven't had public play events. We haven't been. But I love this game. This is a tile drafting and, and collecting, set collecting game. I, I don't even know how to describe it. So you have this mountain, they call it. So a bunch of piles of tiles and five different colors and then on the outside that's called the mountain then you have the path on the outside with more tiles and you pick a tile and then you put it on the mountain and based on what element it is you then take tiles around it in some way so like like fire goes in a column water goes in a row void goes in a like an x pattern earth digs deep and wind is a cross i think something like that i might be mixing up the exact elements there and then when you draft these new tiles, they go on your board of knowledge. And well, what that does is the more knowledge you have in each element means more tiles you get to draft when using those. That's a, that's a kind of high level overview of Garinto. Every, at once everyone's gone twice. So they've, they've gotten one set, they've each drafted twice. You then do scoring and you're gonna do scoring four times. And in the basic game, you're gonna have two scoring cards that stay the same through the whole game. And you're going to get scores for all kinds of things, uh, having different colors, having high stacks, having low stacks, having the lowest stacks. There's a, a deck of cards and they don't change. So one of the optional rules in this game is, is fantastic that lets you play, it's called like seasons of change. You put out four of these scoring cards and every season they rotate, so only two in player at once. I love this variant. I honestly think this should be the basic way to play the game. Like, it is awesome using it that way. That, that is, in my opinion, the best way to play Corinto. The only reason you should not use that is for the first game where you're teaching people to play. From then on, use Seasons of Chains. So we play with Seasons of Chains. Everyone loved that. And we also use the Dragon Tiles, which I haven't used in the production copy until now. And what was interesting is there was actually a change in the rules. So we, we did a prototype preview of this. You can find it on our blog. Um, I don't remember how much I talked about the Dragon Tiles. It was a while ago now. But the dragon tiles are wild cards. So when you're placing them, you can use them as any element when you're going to draft your tiles. When you draft one, you can put it in any knowledge area you want. So it's pretty cool. They're nice and flexible. Um, I find they're the interesting ways to get tiles you normally wouldn't be able to get. When the prototype, you took out one of every color of tile and put in these five dragons which meant the game still had perfect information in a way in the fact that every tile was used every game. So if you wanted to spend the time, you could count. Like if you're trying to have the most purple, you could know by the last round exactly what tiles are going to come up. Not necessarily what order, but at least what tiles will come out and you'd know exactly how many purple are there. Well, they removed that. And I got to admit my initial reaction was, well, that's too bad. Why'd they remove that? But then no one I play with takes the time to do that much counting and imagining trying to do that over four seasons and watching everyone else's tiles i'm just like you know what now they're just like tossing the dragons with the rest so you don't use all the tiles and i gotta say yeah go for it like like unless you're playing with my dad then don't bother <laughs> like it just do it so yeah uh we did that the other bonus is I, I did the biggest game upgrade i've ever done in my game room and we used the lazy susan which I've had that Lazy Susan since Geekropolis Cafe opened, not even closed, open, because it was an old Chinese restaurant and he was just trying to get rid of it. And he was like, I'm like, you're going to throw that out? He's like, oh, yeah. I'm like, give it to me. That's a Lazy Susan. It's huge. Rental with a Lazy Susan is so much better. It is. It really is. Like, they just to be able to turn it 90 degrees to change your perspective. And I'm not even necessarily just talking about being able to see deeper. Just that change in perspective, being able to rotate it, really made the game actually more enjoyable. So I now have a Lazy Susan sitting on my table for now that, that now I, I honestly, it's making me look around my game room, but what else would be better with Lazy Susan? Maybe we should try that now. So I'm like, it's inspiring me to get games off my shelf. So I guess maybe invest in a Lazy Susan. There you go. Uh, and having a look at the, uh, the current rule book for Tales from the Loop. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that looks more like a starter RPG rule yeah. book. No, it's seriously. 22 pages of thick, um, overly graphical rules. Um, and while it's nice to have all the cards so that you're seeing what you're doing, 
the fact that they did graphics outside of just showing you the board game components makes mm -hmm. it that much more difficult to read. Wow. Yeah, I found it. Uh, like I said, reading it, it was fine, but I read role playing rule books. Like, like I can't even imagine. Like, I came at this having played the role playing game. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine trying to crack this nut not having that prior knowledge. Yeah. Like, nope. here's a walnut, but we're not going to give you a nutcracker, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks since we're not going to be here for, not to hear from you for a couple of weeks? Yeah, it'll be a little bit. Um, so, Deanna's birthday is this weekend. So, it's up to her. Uh, I expect we'll be playing some Lost Ruins of Arnak. Um, I totally expect that to happen. I don't know. I mean, she's going to want some Charter Stone on Friday, I'm sure. Um, we are taking a vacation out of town, which will probably mean plays of the Duke. Um, I'm thinking we'll bring Aqualin for the first time and actually prove if it fits well on a bar table or a coffee shop table. Uh, really, it's up to her. Um, I do have an unboxing to do at some point. So I have right here the latest game from boards and dice this is a new standalone teotihuacan game this is not an expansion for teotihuacan it is a new tile drafting game tile laying game based on the teotihuacan universe um this is a pre-production copy an advanced copy so there was an issue with cubes so i have extra cubes on here but i want to do an unboxing of this before we play it so there's going to be that uh I don't know when that's going to happen. Maybe that'll happen before we go away. So it'll be able to go live. Um, I've got some reviews to write. I don't know what we're going to review next week. I honestly, we have lots of options. Um, we got three off the pile of obligation tonight. So that was a nice little boost. And we're going to probably release the these reviews staggered a bit to fill in the gap while we're not here. I am hoping to get an article published uh, this weekend as well. So, I don't know, mainly it's up to D. Um, like I said, Tori and Kat will be coming over Friday night, so we're, we're having a kind of... And then we are going to um, the in-laws, uh, or my in-laws, they're not her in-laws, they're her family, on, on her actual birthday, and probably bring some games to that too. So, uh, for that, we may be checking out the Goonies Escape with... Um, what's his name? One-Eyed Willie's Rich Stuff? Is that the name of the game? Something like that. <laughs> Oh, that's that's probably a horrible. It, it is what I know. It's one-eyed Willie, and I know it's Goonies, but I'm sure you've horribly mixed up the. Uh, is it one-eyed Willie? Because uh, one -eyed... escape with one-eyed. Oh, you're right. It's escape with one-eyed Willie's rich stuff. Wow. Yes. That's really the name of it. Yes. What a horrible name for a game. Sorry. Uh, Haven't you watched the Goonies? Sorry, Senan. No, I know that, but but that's that's just like okay. it's all about his rich stuff, and they keep calling it rich stuff. Yeah, We've got okay. his rich Sorry, stuff. Jay and Sen. I I. I wouldn't have chosen that. That might have been the op. That might not have been Jay and Sen. That's just a, an overly wordy title. Like <laughs> it is. Yeah, but all of those games are like but that, right? It it's like Scooby Doo Goonies, Escape from the Haunted Mansion. But like the Goonies, One Eyed Willie's Rich Stop would make. No, know. I think they're trying to put Escape from in all of yeah, them. I guess. Yeah. I think that's part of their branding, right? Because right. um, it was The Shining Escape from the Overlook Hotel, and it was Scooby Doo Escape from Mystery Mansion. Yeah, so so Razul in the chat is like, oh, I want to play this and I want to play this. You know why it took me so dang long to get those games? Like Tapestry, I was I'm so behind the curve. I think there's two expansions for it now. Um, maybe. Uh basically it'll probably depend on if Stonemeyer offers us a review copy or not. Whether I get those Arnak expansion sounds good, but like we literally just got Arnak. Like, like I got it for Christmas. And I'm like, you know, it'll probably be next Christmas when I get the expansion. <laughs> kind of like Herb Witches for Quacks. I finally got that played. I don't buy a lot of games anymore. I, we don't have the budget for it anymore, unfortunately. So I get games at, on my birthday and Christmas, which are both past. <laughs> and then other than that, it's it's us getting uh, pitched by publishers or us pitching publishers. And right now we have enough in the pile of obligation. I'm not looking for anything new until we get caught up. So might happen um cge has sent us stuff in the past but I, I think they have enough arnak info out there so i don't think they're going to be jumping to get someone else to talk about the review that everyone loves or the review of the expansion there all righty i think we're good and now a quick shout out and thank you to some of our vip guests our patreon backers we greatly appreciate their support brian van beek thank you to one of our growing number of brian's Always open to more. Diane Tuzano. Thanks, Ma. 
the Misdirected Mark podcast, talking gaming and game mastering. Ducas, thank you. Evil John, thanks, Mr. Carney. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, or sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. Yeah, if you like the content we're providing, know what would be awesome this week is if you went and left us a review. We haven't called this one out in a long time, but you can leave reviews on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many other podcatchers. We would greatly appreciate that as it helps more people find our content. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the Pando Suite for the after show and stop by Sundays for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game, game on. on.